Tonight, former Nationalist Party youth armed president is gunned down. Erdogan hints at early elections in 2023. Istanbul mayor and minister of interior continue their beef. We'll have Mediascope's very own Edgar Shaw to make sense of it all. Jailed former co-chair of People's Democratic Party weighs in on national politics. And it's the second anniversary of the Boston University protests. I am Murat Tursan, and this is This Week in Turkey. Our main story tonight, the former Nationalist Movement Party youth arm president was gunned down in broad daylight this week. And so far, we're not quite sure why. But one thing is for sure, this is not just your regular everyday cartel style hit. Sinan Atesh was the former president of Ülkü Ocakları, internationally known as the Grey Wolves. Grey Wolves in name is the youth arm of the country's far right Nationalist Party and ruling government's coalition partner, MHP. The Grey Wolves are a nationalist and pan-Turkic organization seeking to unite all Turkic ethnicities scattered throughout Asia. But the Grey Wolves are also known for political violence. They are banned in France, they are listed as a terrorist organization in Kazakhstan, and the European Parliament has urged all 27 member states of the European Union to do the same. They've been alleged to be linked to bombings, murders, massacres, violence against minorities, as well as having ties to the CIA, NATO, Operation Gladio and everything else under the sun. So when the former president gets gunned down, there are questions. Especially when MHP boss Devlet Bacheli refuses to comment on the murder or even utter Atish's name. Curious. As I've said, the waters are still pretty muddied. There are currently 30 detained in connection with the murder, but we have no motive and no backstory so far. But until the story develops, this is what we have. Former Ulkul Ojaklara chairman Sinan Atesh was killed in a shooting in the capital last Friday. The Ankara governor's office announced that three people were detained in connection with the murder. Latest reports indicate that the detainees are also connected to another murder case from last year. The Ulkul Ojaklara, also known as Grey Wolves in English, is a far-right nationalist organization with connection to Turkey's Nationalist Party, MHP. The organization is often described as the paramilitary arm of the party. On Tuesday, new details of the murder emerged. Allegedly, Atesh told a friend on the morning of his murder that he was seeing someone from the presidential palace. Photos of the two gunmen who fled the scene on motorcycles taken by bystanders surfaced and arrest warrants were issued for 30 people connected to the murder. So far, the Grey Wolves and MHP have not released an official statement regarding Atesh's murder. MHP Chair Devlet Bacheli avoided mentioning Atesh during his weekly address to his party on Tuesday and did not take questions from journalists on the matter. And big things are happening in politics this week as Erdogan hints at early elections, which is a complete 180 from his previous position. In the past, both Erdogan and his coalition partner, MHP boss Bacheli, said time and time again that there will be no early elections. But looks like that's all changing. Now, normally early elections are unheard of anywhere else, but in Turkey, they are actually quite a common occurrence. But why move the election up? Past administrations have moved elections up as a political tool for various reasons. There were early elections in 57, 77, 87, 91, 95, 99, and 2002, and finally 2007. Last time elections were moved up, AKP jumped from 34% of the parliament to 46%. But that doesn't necessarily mean that early elections would guarantee a win. It hasn't always gone in the favor of the ruling party. Sometimes it has the opposite effect. So why reverse positions now? That's something Edgar Shaw can answer, but let's get the details first. Reports that the AKP's executive board has been actively discussing an earlier election date made headlines in Turkey this week. As the country approaches what will be a decisive and highly contested presidential election this spring. Originally scheduled for June 18th of this year, Turkey's ruling party AKP has taken steps to move the general election up to a date this spring. 
Following several weeks of speculation, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan confirmed in a statement on Thursday that an earlier election date was indeed a possibility. The recent warming to the notion of an early election marks a shift in the attitude for the ruling bloc. Erdogan had previously rebuffed the suggestion of moving the elections to an earlier date. Amid rapid currency devaluation in December of 2021, in which the lira plunged from 12 to 18 to the dollar in a matter of days, President Erdogan made a statement saying, there will be no early election, period. The swift devaluation, caused in large part by the president's lowering the central bank's interest rates, had led to calls by many opposition members for earlier polls. While 30th of April and the 7th of May have been discussed as possible early election dates, reports this week indicate that the 14th of May appeared the likeliest option. Main opposition party CHP spokesperson Faik Ostrak made a cautious and suspicious statement saying, We will say yes to a new election date until the beginning of April. If a later date is chosen, then it will be an election designed purely by AKP's political engineering. And before we go to Edgar, there is one more story that we should take a look at. It's the beef between the now convicted mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem Imamoglu, and the Minister of Interior, Suleyman Soylu. A little recap. Imamoglu is CHP's Istanbul mayor, the largest city in the country by far. And Imamoglu fought a hard battle to win his seat. In 2019, Imamoglu won his election by a narrow margin, and the High Election Council threw out the election. The election was re-held in June, and Imamoglu won by a comfortable 10-point lead. But not before Imamoglu filed a complaint with the European Parliament. For doing so, Soylu called Imamoglu a fool, and Imamoglu says the fools are those who threw out the election, meaning the High Election Council. And bam. Guess that's good enough to get convicted and banned from politics for life because that's exactly what happened to Imamolu last month. At least for now, as the decision is being appealed. But that's not all. Imamolu was also under investigation for walking among the tomb of Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror with his hands behind his back, which the minister interpreted as disrespectful. But the show is not over yet. Then the minister comes back with yet another charge accusing Imamolu of harboring terrorists in the ranks of the Metropolitan Municipality, even though all hires must pass a background check, which of course is done by the Ministry of Interior. So at this point, I think it's safe to say that the minister is quite displeased with the mayor for his walk, his talk, and the hiring that he himself, in theory, should have vetted. Yet the hirings of the governor of Istanbul is not under question, which also has to go through the same process. And that does not sit well with Imamolu one little bit. Let's go to the details. A duel of words broke out between the Minister of Interior Suleyman Soylu and Istanbul Mayor Ekrem Imamolu over the course of the week. Imamolu spoke out against the Interior Minister behind the scenes investigation on the alleged terrorism ties with certain municipality employees at Wednesday's press conference. He called Soylu out to substantiate his allegations. If the indictment includes the former mayor Mevlut Unsal, the governor of Istanbul Ali Yerlikaya, as well as their staff, then I have no objections. However, if the charges arbitrarily single me and my staff out, we are going to bring the sky down on them. Governor Yerlikaya's hires were also cleared by the Minister of Interior. Suilu struck back saying, those who are trying to recover the ground that they lost in their own party by attacking us or by misleading the public are doing so in vain. I am talking about Imamolu. He called me, paid me his respects and told me he is not liked within the CHP headquarters and asked for my help. I told him I could do whatever the law mandates, said Suilu. We have already done our security background checks on 920 employees and they came out clean. The minister ignored Imamolo's open challenge that his predecessors should also be investigated and added to say, my predecessors have also hired them so I followed the suit, is farcical at best. Ekrem Imamolo did not hold back after Soylu's remarks. He held an ad hoc press conference and questioned Soylu's track record on political loyalty and candor to step out of Erdogan's shadow. 
I've never asked for favors. I've never sold out my family. I don't expect someone who had abandoned his party on a moment's notice and swerved 180 degrees overnight to appreciate what loyalty means. Joining me now, a familiar face, Mediscope's very own, Edgar Shar. Edgar, always a pleasure. For me too. Now, Edgar, let's start with Atesha's murder here. At this moment, this murder is still shrouded in secrecy, but we can tell there is some smoke there. This doesn't really look like a regular everyday murder. So uh, without going into too much speculation, I want to ask you this. What does this murder case mean for Turkish politics, in your opinion? Well, uh, I'm not sure if I can really answer this question without uh, going deep into the spec speculations, you know, because it's uh, the only thing we have now re regarding this murder. Well, as you said, it's not an ordinary murder, and I wish, um, you know, uh, we had never talked about an ordinary murder in, in Turkey or in any country. But even uh, under the circumstances of um, uh, a pre-election tension, you know, it's not an ordinary murder. And it has to be, you know, investigated very well. Uh, and I can say that uh, the police uh, is now, um, uh, you know, digging into uh, the murder. Um, this is what I have understood from, um, you know, of the happenings of last night. Uh, you know, one person has been taken into custody and uh, also the investigation um, has become very interesting as it uh, also included uh, people from the special forces of police and also some, you know, um, uh, nationalist MHP links. So uh, in any case, you know, it's uh, a very very uh, important investigation that should be done. Otherwise, my fear is that we would go uh, uh, to the electoral period under suspicions and with a constant fear that something like this may occur again to other people. So it's uh, by no means a good news for Turkey. So I think uh, the only thing that should be done is a clear investigation and an also a speedy um, uh, so, uh, resolution of, of the entire case. Here's hoping. And Edgar, let's move on to the big story this week. President Erdogan appears to be softening his stance on early elections. Famously, both him and Bacheli reiterated time and time again that, that there would be no early elections whatsoever. So uh, why the sudden change of heart, do you think? Well, that would come sooner or later, actually, and uh, it came not um, later than many would expect. Actually, it's it it, it is time to talk about uh, an an early elections if if we will have one. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we have been talking about early elections is because um, there 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 have been legal discussions regarding the third time candidacy of President Erdogan, which um, um, the People's Alliance, the ruling alliance, uh, argues uh, is not the third time candidacy, but the second time candidacy, which is totally okay with the, with the current constitution. But uh, as far as I know, and as far as I uh, have heard from the 99% of the constitutional lawyers in Turkey, it is the third time candidacy and under uh, the current constitution, it's by no means possible. But at the end of the day, everybody is uh, everybody is um, aware that it would be up to the um, Supreme Electoral Board uh, who is to decide about this. And we know that uh, this board is not an independent uh, board that uh, takes its decisions uh, only according to the current regulations and, and laws, which uh, we saw, for example, um, um, in, in, in 2019 uh, local elections, whereby the board canceled the elections in Istanbul in May, and, uh, and we had to just go to a rerun of the elections in June. So um, 
uh, we know that uh, if you know the Supreme uh, Board of Elections uh, would be to decide about the candidacy of Mr. Erdogan, I don't think that they they will be giving a negative uh, ruling about this. Uh, but in any way, um, even if um, the current ruling coalition doesn't think that it's a third time uh, candidacy, uh, they would not. Uh, like the candidacy of Mr. Erdogan to be overshadowed by some legitimacy questions. And uh, at the end of the day, they would prefer um, the parliament to decide about an early elections, which is, you know, as per the current constitution, the only way that allows Mr. Erdogan to, to, to run for president for the third time. Uh, but after... Um, the table of six opposition parties very clearly underlined that they will not be uh, agreeing to any uh, early election offer coming from the government uh, to be held after uh, April the 6th. I think um, the ruling bloc does not have any hope uh, left for uh, a parliamentary decision regarding uh, the uh, regarding the early election. So. If we will have an early election, which we seem to be uh, having uh, because of the concerns of the ruling bloc regarding uh, the, the the schedule, the electoral schedule, um, it must be out of the decision of uh, the president himself. So the president will uh, just take Turkey into uh, early elections. Um, and uh, with this decision, they will not be able to, you know, uh, prevent the discussions regarding the legitimacy of Mr. Erdogan's third time uh, candidacy. But at the end of the day, uh, the opposition also said that they would not uh, legally challenge uh, this candidacy in order not to give him a reason, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to talk about... Uh, um, um, the covert duty of the, uh, the opposition. So uh, at the end of the day, I think it will be the president's decision to call the early elections. I see. And Edgar, you meant rerun, uh, you mentioned rerun elections back there. So it's only apropos that we talk about Imamoglu and Soylu. I want to end on this. Uh, we spoke at length about the fight between Imamoglu and Soylu last time, but one thing still escapes me. President Erdogan appears to be quite distant from the fight between mayor and the minister, at least publicly. Uh, why do you think this is? Why do you think Soylu is the one who's beating on Imamola? After what Sedat Peker um, has been saying about Soylu and his fight with Mr. Soylu, I don't think Mr. Soylu is um, um, still a respected politician, even even as far as the ruling coalition, ruling bloc is concerned. And that's why I think Mr. Erdogan just avoids, you know, backing him publicly, even if, you know, we know that we don't have any doubt that um, uh, Mr. Erdogan is not fond of Mr. Imamoglu either. So uh, I think this is uh, because of this reason. And um, and these are also dangerous um you know, uh, steps to be taken even by an authoritarian government. Because, you know, people are talking about appointment of a trustee to to uh, Istanbul municipality uh, due to uh, uh, some ter terrorism charges, which we see are um, not well uh, substantiated. But still, uh, such a risky move um, would be very difficult, even for Mr. Erdogan to back. So under these circumstances, I think Mr. Soylu is a, a suitable uh, actor within the uh, ruling bloc uh, to be the perpetrator of such, uh, you know, quote-unquote dangerous uh, actions. And I think it is because of this reason that Mr. Erdogan uh, probably preferred Mr. Soylu to be the main actor behind all these, rather than himself or or uh, the larger 
people's alliance. So I think this um, is the only answer I can give to this question. But on the other hand, we know that uh, because these are very dangerous steps to be taken, um, we know that such a dangerous step can only be taken by a very solid um, move to be taken by the by the ruling bloc, and uh, such a solid move cannot be easily taken because um, we know that there there have been also fighting cliques within the ruling bloc, you know. Um, uh, which uh, Mr. Soylu is the representative, only one of them, you know. Um, and if such a very dangerous uh, action is taken by the government, it means that these cliques just uh, have given up their, uh, their fight and uh, have become consolidated in their fight against the opposition. And now with, uh, the, uh, with the, the, the recent uh, political murder that we have talked about, I think this fight within the cliques uh, of the ruling bloc have um, uh, exacerbated once again, and uh, it may postpone a probable appointment of a trustee uh, even further, you know, some weeks further. We, but we never know. Uh, we can never say that the uh, that the ruling bloc actually um, um, changed its mind about appointment of a trustee because um, getting control of the Istanbul municipality uh, in the course of the campaign trail would, in any case, be very essential for the ruling bloc, and that is the very reason why I think that uh, they may come up with this step, this dangerous step, um, anytime in, in the near future. I see. Edgar, thank you for breaking that down. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Murat. And in domestic politics, the jailed former People's Democratic Party co-chair, Selatin Demirtas, weighed into politics this week and attempted to keep heads cool. Demirtas was jailed by the government for allegedly having ties to PKK, a terrorist organization. Despite the European Human Rights Court ordering his release, Demirtas, formerly a presidential hopeful, now sits in a maximum security prison in Edirne province and occasionally writes letters through his lawyer. This week, Demirtas attempted to corral the opposition coalition and urge them to learn to live together. The opposition coalition, made up of six parties, almost solely constructed to defeat Erdogan polls quite well but is constantly in danger of breaking up due to irreconcilable differences, shall we say. Demirtas invited cooler heads to prevail this week in a letter he wrote through his lawyer, and here's that story. Former HDP co-chair Selhatim Demirtas, who is currently imprisoned in Adirne prison, discussed the joint candidate debate in his article published on T24. Turkey's opposition coalition, made up of six parties aiming to defeat President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in the upcoming presidential election, have yet to announce a joint presidential candidate but are expected to in the near future. In his article, the imprisoned former HDP leader said the following, 2023 is a year ripe for change in Turkey. The options are very clear. Either democracy will be crowned as a law of the land and continue on its way, or the one-man regime will evolve into a kind of kingdom or sultanate. We will see if the opposition as a whole will be able to face up to this difficult challenge and deliver a democratic victory to the people. 27 parties are entering the election. Five of them are from the ruling bloc, 22 from the opposition. Can most, if not all, of the 22 opposition parties unite around a common candidate? For example, with a 10-point, one-page manifesto for democracy, it would be a tragedy if they didn't. Can alliances prepare joint lists in order to produce the highest number of representatives among themselves? It would be a shame if they didn't do that. Whatever the government does, no matter what tricks it uses, the people have made their decision. What falls to the opposition is to turn this decision of the people into a power of change with unity and determination. History will not look back fondly on an opposition that fails in this duty. 
There is no need for a miracle to turn the nearly 70% electoral power that wants change into victory. On the contrary, it would be a miracle if the opposition lost. And tonight we'll end on this video. This is the second year anniversary of the Boazichi University protests, and they are still going strong. Last year, AKP politician Melih Bulu was appointed as the rector of Boazichi University by presidential decree. Boazichi usually selects its own rector internally, but according to the faculty, this makes him the first rector to be appointed without a vote since the 1980 military coup. And this has caused a monumental backlash from both the students and the faculty, triggering the Boazichi protests. But it didn't stop there. The protesters were branded as terrorists by President Erdogan, anarchists by MHP boss Bacili, and Interior Minister Suleyman Soylu weighed in saying that the rector appointment process need not be democratic at all. The fight escalated, of course, when students brandishing the LGBT flag were branded as perverts by the president and Bulu ordered the LGBT club closed. And of course, the opposition is staunchly on the university's side. Imam Olu has stood alongside the supporters as well as CHB chair Kılıçdaroğlu. And Melih Bulu was dismissed from his position last year, six months into his tenure, again by presidential decree. However, his aide, Naji Inji, now holds the helm. And in effect, not much has changed for the university. And thus, the protests continue. Here's that video. Good night. Her hukuksuzluğun 
yasalar önünde bir gün mutlaka hesabının sorulması için elimizden gelen gayreti göstereceğiz. Akademisyenlerimize, öğrencilerimize ve dolayısıyla üniversitemize onun özel ve özgür ortamına büyük zarar verilmiş ve verilmektedir. Öğrencilerine de biz ailelere karşı duydukları sorumlulukla yaz kış demeden her gün ayakta dimdik durarak tepkilerini gösteren akademisyenlere ve mücadelenin bel kemiği öğrencilere, yürekten desteğini sunan değerli mezunlara, her gün çocuklarını merak eden, olayları tedirginlik içinde izleyen biz ailelere kulak vermek yerine ne yazık ki haksız uygulamalarda ve hatalarda ısrar edilmektedir. Boğaziçi direnişi ikinci yılını doldururken Türkiye'de özerk, özgür ve katılımcılık ilkelerine dayalı bir üniversite gerçekleşene kadar biz aileler olarak onların yanındayız.